You know, and like my brother Dennis said, despite what the naysayers say, there are people out there who do, want, who do not want to be homosexual. I know. Because I was one too. And so you see, there's people out there who's struggling with a whole bunch of different things. You see, it's not about homosexuality. It doesn't matter. We're in a ministry of reconciliation. Our job is to reconcile people to God. That's what we do. That's what we're called to do. A ministry of reconciliation. And so it's my hope today as I share a a little bit of my story that Holy Spirit would come and He would change your heart and change your mind. Because I want you to understand what 1 John 4, 18 says. That there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And it's my prayer also that the Holy Spirit would come and transform our minds, transform our hearts and the way we act. And that you would have a much deeper understanding of this scripture. So when I was about six years old, I became sexually active. There were some relatives that came out to visit for the summer. And two of my cousins came out. And and there was a boy and a girl cousin. And one was about my age and one was a little bit older. And the boy, he decided to uh, show me different things and how to touch his body and how I should be able to touch my body. And eventually, we started touching each other's body and everything felt really good and it was cool. Everything tickled and it was great, you know? Didn't understand. Well, eventually, my female cousin got involved and then I began to touch her body and she began to touch my body and boy, did that feel good. And, you know, everything was just moving along. But this summer profoundly changed my life, profoundly. Because it was in this summer that I discovered fear. Fear. One day my grandmother caught my female cousin and I fooling around. We were playing doctor. (laughs) And she caught us and she spazzed out. She flipped out. She started screaming and yelling, little boys are not supposed to do that to little girls. Get away from her. Don't you do that. No explanation. No rhyme or reason. All I knew is that it felt good. I didn't know what I had done wrong and nobody explained it to me. Fear. The second thing that happened was my cousins um, used to like to make fun of my little naked boy body. And so I began to think, hey, there's something wrong with me. Why are these people making, what, what's wrong with this? Why are you laughing at me? What's, what's wrong? And so I began to realize at that point that maybe I was different. I wasn't the same as everybody else. And so the summer ends. And now I continue on in my new found pastime of masturbation and pleasuring myself and constantly thinking about the times that he and I spent together and just desiring that and, you know, just wanting to do something like that. The following summer, they come out again, only this time things escalated. Uh, My one boy cousin, he decided to tell some of the older boys in the neighborhood, um, what we were doing, and then there was one boy in particular who kind of got involved, and um, he laughed at me too. And so I just remember thinking, whoa, there's something terribly wrong with me. Why is it that people keep laughing at me? What's wrong with me? And fear set in. And you know, fear is a terrible thing. It'll make us think and do all kinds of crazy stuff, won't it? You know, as I grew older, I began to think things like, the reason I didn't do well of this test is because I'm different. If only God would just fix this thing, then everything else would be right. I wasn't very gifted at sports. I'm still not. And, but I was very gifted in the arts. I could sing. I can dance. I took dancing lessons and piano lessons, I played the clarinet, and I had a whole plethora of all strange exotic instruments my mom would buy for me. I even have spoons. 
And so that wasn't normal, right? Kid, boys don't do that. They were all playing baseball and football, and, you know, the ball would come at me, and I'd be like, uh, you know, and <laughs> duck down. You know, there's this flying object coming at me, you know? And so I began to fear the other boys. I was afraid of them. I didn't want to play with them. I mean, I did. I kind of wanted to join in the reindeer games, but, you know, I had a big red nose, and everybody was like, I didn't understand. And so I kept my distance, you know, and the other boys would kind of make fun of Timmy Femi, who could sing and do all this stuff. Now, I liked playing with the girls, too, except, you know, eight, ten years old, you know, little girls like to play house, and they always want to get married. I can't tell you how many wedding rings and married ceremonies I was in, you know. And then they would like to kiss, and, you know, and that felt good. But little boys are not supposed to do that to little girls. So I was getting conflicted and confused. I didn't know which end was up. By the time I was in ninth grade, my nickname was Flamer. Walked down the hallways of the school. Flamer! Hey, Flamer! Something very profound happened to me between seventh and eighth grade. We moved. And those years, those middle school years, man, those are so informative. Your kids are so awkward. You guys remember, right? You're just feeling so like your bodies are changing. And these guys over here are starting to get like hair. And, you know, the girls are starting to develop in other places. And yet girls are still icky. Yet this guy likes girls, right? And so I began to go through that and start looking at what it was that the girls liked about those guys. And I began to study them, and I began to obsess over that. What makes them who they are, and what's wrong with me? How can I be like them? And I just didn't have it, you know? I just didn't believe that about myself. And I thought, God, really? You made me so ugly. You're so ugly, God. Why would you do this? There's something wrong with me. You made a mistake, obviously. So we move, and now, seventh grade was tough, but... I kind of had proven myself a little bit to most of my classmates, you know. It's kind of like, this is our crazy weird person, but we love him, so don't pick on him, you know. So as I got to middle school in seventh grade, we moved to, we, uh, I went to Island Middle School, where we had people from all different school districts finally coming in. And so they kind of protected me a little bit. And when the boys asked me to sing, it's because I really could sing, and I knew that they wanted it, but I was too shy and too afraid that somebody else was going to make fun of me, and you know, and all the girls, I was like first chair clarinet player, so all the girls were, you know, all over me, and they just wanted to be everything, but I was afraid. Because if the boys laughed at me, and girls are definitely going to laugh at me. I'm not like the other boys. If they're expecting that, wrong. So in eighth grade, we moved to uh, Cranford, and, and I went to Orange Avenue Middle School, and let me tell you, that was a rude awakening. This town was so hard to break into. If you were not born in this town, you were not part of this town. Their parents were all wealthy. They had lots of money. My parents made an attempt to, to better me, and I, I had lots of great opportunities there. I'm glad they did. But I wasn't part of the group. And you know, the first day of school, nobody talked to me. Nobody. Except one girl. She said, get out of that seat. I'm sitting there. And I said, too bad, I'm here. <laughs> it didn't go over too well, right? <laughs> Except for one boy. One boy was nice to me. That's not to say he didn't make friends during the year, but I, I'm still an outsider. And, and, and this one boy was always nice to me. But there's something off about this dude. I, I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but I don't know, you know? Eighth grade, we're all gawky, right? So... About 14 years old, I move on into high school, and about 14 years old, 15 years old, my cousin came out to visit again. And so I propositioned him and said, hey, you want to do what we used to do? And he said, no. Why not? Well, I don't do that anymore. Why not? I just don't do that anymore. And there I was, rejected again. What is wrong with me? So I began to excel at school, a lot of A's, Honor Society, French National Honor Society. I began to excel on stage, and I was very active in the theater and very good. And 
I remember that we were doing um, Oklahoma. And it was tech week, and the band's practicing and playing all the dance numbers. And, you know, the actors had a chance to just hang out on break while the orchestra worked on something. And so me and this boy that was always very friendly with me in eighth grade decided to just start fooling around like everybody else does in theater. If you've been around plays, you know, we started dancing on stage and doing the two-step, and we were doing the dances full out and having a great old time. And we did this big finale, got off stage... And he looked at me, and he tried to kiss me. And I kind of was like, whoa. He said, oh, I'm sorry. He goes, I just got caught up in the whole, you know, acting thing. He says, I'm sorry. Okay. This is great, maybe. You know, I, look, I'm naive. I, I don't know much, you know. I don't, it takes a long time for me to figure stuff out. I still don't believe stuff, you know. And so a few weeks later, he and I are... Um, with two other girls in his parents' hot tub. He had a, his parents had a hot tub, and we are sitting there, and the bubbles are going, and the four of us are just hanging out, laughing, and having a good time. And, and I feel this hand start moving up my thigh, and I wasn't sure at first, you know, it felt good, but I was like, whoa. And so I reached down to grab it, and it was his hand. So I pulled it off, and I kind of glared at him, and he just kept doing it, and he kept making me uncomfortable. Now, I didn't want to, like, make a scene. I didn't want to yell at him or you know, say anything in front of the girl that would eventually become his girlfriend and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, I just kind of dealt with it and just the best I could and went home. Well, he would begin to, to call me up. And he would begin to breathe heavy on the phone. And I, of course, like I said, I'm not so bright. And I'm like, what? And then it would like, oh, man. And I would be like, dude, I'm going. Bye. And that happened a couple of times. And so finally, though, I guess, you know, if Satan's persistent enough, he wears you down. And he calls me up, and I just finally listened to what he said one day. And he said, hey, um, he said, I got some porn. And he said, uh, I got some, you know, I want to know if you want to come over and masturbate together. And I was like, oh, you know what? I was like, you know what? Fine, just, just let me do this. This, he'll go away now. He'll just leave me alone if I do this thing. You know, if I just give in, the curiosity will be gone and then we'll be done. So I went. And when I got to his house, we went up to his room and the dude attacks me. Starts kissing me, groping me. And you know what? I didn't stop him. It was such a rush, such adrenaline. I had been longing, longing for another boy who to want me and see something good in me since my cousin. And you know something? I just went along with it. Just went along with it. And so I left and I went home and I was sick. I mean, I was sick to my stomach. And I started crying and I started praying to God and praying to God, please, Lord, take this away from me. Take this away. This can't happen. This can't be this. I'm not supposed to be this way, Lord. Why won't you do anything? And so you see, that day my worst fear was recognized. I was gay. That was tough. And it was also about this time that I got into pornography and I mean, I had seen pornography as a kid, right? Guys, you, you remember the magazines, you'd find them in the garbage, ooh, you know. But VCR was really starting to take off, and I had a collection of VCR tapes, and boy, talk about fear and insecurity. Those things are not real, guys. That is an unrealistic, ungodly standard. It's a movie. No person can jump off a 40-foot building and land on their feet, right? We know that. These are not real. And with every frame that I watched, all I kept cementing into me is that I am deficient. I am not like that. I could never be like that. This guy is right. And I'm just craving this, and I want this, and I would study. And instead of making me feel better, it would make me feel worse because I wasn't that. It just served to cement in that there was something wrong with me. And if that is what sex is about, and if that's what girls want, I'm in trouble. Although I was more the porn star with the boys, so at least that made me feel a little good. So we, time goes on. And finally, I was very active in the church. I loved God. I've always loved God since I was a little kid. I remember talking to God as a little, little boy. 
being out. I still remember being on the steps and the wind would blow and I'd look up and talk to God and God would talk to me and we'd just hang out. But at about 16, I was, this was just weighing too hard on me. And so it was, this is when I discovered the wonderful world of drugs and uppers and downers and all kinds of fun stuff. And you know, the one thing about the drugs, and I'll be honest with you, man, they gave me such confidence. Because here's what was so cool. Like all my pothead friends, man, they didn't care what I was. We were just all going to get high. We were just going to hang out. And we'd talk up and we'd get high. And we just had a great old time. And man, I embraced drugs wholeheartedly. I was a wake and bake kind of guy. If you guys don't know what that means, it means I would wake up and bake my brain before my feet hit the floor. Breathe the smoke right out the window. And I lived across the street from the high school, so I would come home whenever I could, get high again. Knew how to get on the roof of the school, so me and my buddies would go up on the roof. I did this every single day like this, and I even night capped. I would go, and I'd just choke right before I go to bed, hit the pillow, and that was my life. I do not remember my junior and senior year, not much of it. There's stuff in my yearbook, I'm like, I was where, and I, we did what? I do not remember. I do not remember. But you want to know something? These drugs, man, made the Navy bold. Because all of a sudden I had some confidence. If these guys could be with me, why not these guys? And you saw what I would do is I'd get really high. And I'd start banging on his window at midnight. And I'd go to his house. Because I knew that he wanted what I had. And I'd go and I'd just be part of it. And boy, it just gave me such power to be wanted. So you can understand why at 16... I told God, see you later, man. I can't do this. See, I was so active in the church. I remember my baptism. I was raised Roman Catholic. My parents were, my mom was Roman Catholic. My dad was Pentecostal, home church and all that kind of stuff. And somehow they got married. And when they got married, apparently, I don't know what happened, why they stopped going to church. But I got to be about six years old. And my dad said, well, he needs some religion in his life. So you might as well bring him to the Catholic church since you know that it's something. And so I remember my baptism. And I remember uh, Father Loretti, who made Monsignor before he died. Congratulations. I remember my baptism. I remember reading the service manual. I remember him doing his thing, you know, and I remember him stopping. And I remember him looking down at me. And he grabbed my chin and I looked up. And he said to my mother, take care of this one, Mama. He's special. And I was always in CCD. I was go and I would light candles and pray and eating up my little Catholic Christian doctrine books and learning about God. I had the Ten Commandments memorized. Just loved God. I even took the confirmation name Luke. And that was right around Star Wars. And everybody was thinking because it was Luke Skywalker. No, it's because Luke, although he was pretty cool, right? But he wasn't because Luke, in my mind, was a doctor and he helped people. And I wanted to help people. I wanted to be a priest. And so by the time I was 16 years old at St. Michael's Parish in Cranford, New Jersey, I was doing three services a Sunday. Saturday night, I'd go and I'd get the message. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, I was in the adults, what they called the adult service. And I would go and I would be singing in that choir. And then at the 12 o'clock service, which was the contemporary service, I'd be up there singing. I was also a cantor. So I'd be the guy that they're, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh Okay, that was me in high school. And I wasn't hiding behind God. I genuinely wanted to be there. I got friends with the priests. Father Paul and I used to go bowling all the time. I was always in the rectory and he was always teaching me scriptures. True believer, that guy. But I remember where I was at 16 years old in the breezeway between the sacristy and the rectory. And I told God, God, I can't do this. I, I can't serve you. You're perfect. I'm not. I, uh, I got to be perfect. I got to be better than this. I hope you understand. And I walked away. And just life, whew, just embraced evil wholeheartedly after that. So I get up to college, you know, and I just figured, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. Man, I came out of the closet so hard that lasted for about three days where I was going to protect myself. And my philosophy was, if you can't beat him, then join him. And so I became as fabulous as I could possibly be. I had my freedom rings, and I was 
gay pride, go to New York City, to the parades. Just wanted it. And I just became so loose in the drugs, it really didn't matter because I was in control. As long as I was feeling good, it didn't matter. So I got so bold <laughs> that I told my parents, well, that didn't go over well. Man, they were not happy. And they started quoting scripture at me and started telling me, don't you know, it's an abomination and you're going to go to hell and all this stuff. I mean, they were scared. You know, I'm not, not bad mouth them. They were scared. They had fear too. What was the future going to look like? And so it was also about this time that I met the guy whom I would spend the next almost seven years of my life with. And um, this was a volatile relationship. Domestic violence. It was raped twice. He would bring people home. We were not monogamous to any stretch of the means, but man, we had a chemistry. Sex and drugs, man. It was awesome. Not really, but... And it just was like a drug. I was so addicted to this guy. I just couldn't get away from him, though. We'd break up, and then we'd come back, and it was, it was terrible. It was like a yo-yo. See, my thinking was this. How could I leave somebody who wanted to be with me so much? That reminds me of Jesus. Do you remember when Peter, well, when Jesus, towards the end of his ministry, John chapter 6, verse 67 and forward, I believe, Jesus is starting to talk about really difficult teachings. He said, you know, you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh, and I am the bread of life, and, you know, you got to do all this hard stuff. And so his disciples started, like, leaving. They're like, this is too much for us, too hard. And so Jesus, so Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you guys going to leave too? Do you want to leave? And Peter, I believe it was, says, Lord, where are we going to go? Your words are eternal life. And what I used to think about my lover, I now think about Jesus. Why would I want to leave somebody who loves me so much, who wants me so much? So what I want to do now is share with you how Jesus proved he loved me more than anything in the world. So I'm in this volatile relationship, and it was August 1991, and Billy Graham crusade was getting ready to come around the metropolitan area. And my Aunt Joanne and my Uncle Mario um, called me up and said, hey, do you want to go to the Billy Graham crusade? And I was like, yeah, no, I ain't going. No way, no how. I'm not going to be with all those Christian weirdos. They're all so happy and smiling all the time. You know, they were always like, how you doing? Oh, you know, it's hard, but Jesus loves us. I feel like whatever. You know, we used to call them the frozen chosen. <laughs> it's a family joke. And I just, you know, it was like, and they were always like, so when are you going to get a girlfriend? When are you going to get married, you know? And they were always about us and them, us and them, you know? And I just distanced myself. Well, it's now Tuesday, September 3rd, 1991. And me and my lover are supposed to go out and have this great old time. And once again, he stands me up, as was his custom. So I was mad. I was so angry. I was so angry. So out of my anger, anger makes us do stupid things, but in this case, it wasn't a stupid thing. I called my aunt and uncle up, and I was like, hey, you guys still going to that Billy Graham thing? Yeah, we're just about ready to leave. Can I still come? Yeah, we'll be right there. You know what I love about my Aunt Joanne? God rest her soul. She's passed on now. She died on Easter. <laughs> Is that they never once batted an eye. They were never like, oh, praise God. They just were like, okay, come on. Just matter of fact. And so they picked me up. We went to see Billy Graham, or Bud Graham, as I like to call him. Because if you've ever been in the arena, the Brendan Byrne Arena, there's a big Budweiser sign. It just says Bud. And it was right above his head. So I just remember thinking, Bud Graham. <laughs> and so we get there, and, and people are singing, and their hands are up, and they're just happy and joyful. And it wasn't the, the hokey, frozen, chosen thing that I was used to. It was actually quite inviting, and I wanted that. I wanted that peace. I wanted that love. They had light. I wanted light. I lived in the darkness. 
And so Billy Graham gives his message and he says, you know, we're going to do a public declaration of faith. You got to come because every time somebody declares their love for Jesus, it's always public. So we're going to do an altar call. And he invites people to come down and I'm sitting there, you know, spirits working on my heart. People are crying. People are praying. People are saying, I look over my aunt and uncle and they're just looking forward. Of course, I know what they were thinking now. They were like, oh, please, God, please just make this boy get up and walk down there, you know. <laughs> So I did. I walked down the hall steps. I get into the sea of people. And there's a lot of people. And I get up and work my way as close to the front as I could. And I stand there. And the crowd's starting to thin out. Then the arena workers start breaking down the bleachers and the chairs. The platform's going away. And it's just me. And the workers, there's nobody there. So I was just about to give up in this little, kind of like, sorry, I was thinking he looked like Gollum with hair, but that's just a bad thing. <laughs> this guy comes up to me, forgive me, brother, someday I'm going to love on you in heaven. And so this little man comes up to me and he had weird eyes and stringy hair. And he's like, has anybody talked to you yet? And I was like, no. And I said, he said, let me get your name and phone number. And honestly, I don't remember if he prayed with me or not. He, but I know he never shared with me about Jesus. And he left. And so there I was, alone at the altar. So I left. My aunt and uncle waited for me. And we went back home. Now I'm born again, right? Because I went up for the altar call. But you know what? God didn't leave me there. Jesus met me. See, he began to work things in my life all of a sudden. I began to hear stuff on the radio as I'd flip through the stations. I'd stop for a minute and listen to WAWZ and hear a sermon and hear a few minutes of it before I turned it off. I began to hear Christian songs. I began to hear truth all over and I knew God was speaking. I could hear it. I knew it was Him. He even worked in my parents. See, my mom and dad stopped being so negative. And my mom's got a great testimony about this, but maybe someday she'll tell it with us. She, had, she just started being different. She just started asking how he was doing. Like, she wasn't accepting it. Because, you know, we don't. But she was recognizing that I was more than what I was struggling with, what I was doing. That I was a person. That we had jobs. And we had lives. And we had different things we were struggling with. So she started focusing in on those things. And I, and I knew that she was trying. So she gave me this cassette tape to listen to you. And now, I don't know if you guys know what a cassette is. It's a plastic disc with like a reel-to-reel. No, they know. They don't get my references at youth group, but my wife always has to be like, Tim, they, don't, they never saw that movie, you know? I don't know. So she gives me this cassette. It took me a long time to listen to it, you know, because I was afraid of what was going to be on it. But one day I figured, you know, she's been really good. I was like, she's met me halfway. The least I can do is meet her halfway. So I put this cassette in the car, push the button, you know. And it was James Dobson's Focus on the Family. And on this particular broadcast, he was talking about homosexuality. He and his guest, and I don't remember who the guest was. And, and it was different. It wasn't all this hate stuff, and it wasn't horrible. And in it, they shared... The scripture. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. And do you know what happened? For the first time in my life, I had hope. For the first time. Because nestled in there with all the other sins of adultery and fornication and swindling and cheating... It was my little sin. 
that day, Jesus leveled the playing field for me. I didn't feel like I was the lowest of the low anymore. I realized at that point that God hated it all. He's an equal opportunity hater. He hates everybody the same. But you know what? Truthfully, he, he hates the sin. And we, we throw that around as believers. Oh, love the person, hate the sin. But we don't live that. Because if we did, we'd watch how we talk to one another and watch what we say when we're out in public and watch what we say to people whom we know nothing about. And so, see, I had this dual life going on. In one sense, I was this dark person over here, just living all these sins. But man, I was in the newspaper all the time. I had getting awards, accolades, graduating in the top 10% of my class. Like all this stuff. It's just like, but if anybody knew, you know, I had this secret dark life. And I realized something when I read that. And God began to speak to me. He said, you want to know something? Your sin is no worse than anybody else's. It is no worse than anybody else's. If you've ever taken the slightest little thing, you are a thief. You have broken and transgressed God's law. And if you remember what I preached on sin several weeks ago, about a month and a half ago, right? All sin is heinous to God. The wages of sin is death. And so I began to have this attitude in my mind that, well, if being gay is my only sin, man, then let me be guilty. Because I don't steal anymore. I don't, you know, I did when I was younger, but I started to get better, you know. And, 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 and I, I'm not doing half these things. I'm not committing adultery. I'm not doing this. So God's saying, look, dude, all these things are not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. See, and what we need to realize, church, is that homosexuality and all this kind of, this is not new to God. This is not new. It's been around since the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes along and he convinces Adam and Eve that God is a liar, God is a deceiver, and he's trying to keep them from things that he doesn't want their well-being in mind. And all the time he was describing himself. And they believed him. And what happened? Instantly, broken fellowship with God. Instantly, Adam and Eve became uncomfortable in their own skin with who they were. They tried to cover each other up. Genesis chapter 4, the next chapter after that, Cain kills Abel. The same chapter, Adam's great, 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 great grandson has two wives. And he boasts about the two men that he's, one he's killed and one he's hurt because of his two wives. And he perverts God's justice for Cain into some, I don't know, he just perverts it. Then you get just a few more chapters over to chapter, was it nine? Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, uh, uh, the flood, right? And God destroys the world. He said, because there's just so much unrighteousness. The thought of every man's heart is evil all the time. Wages of sin is death. You get to Genesis chapter 17 and 18 and you've got Sodom and Gomorrah and everybody wants to focus in on the fact that it was those, those Sodomites. They wanted to sleep with the angels. Don't miss that Lot took his daughters and put them out there and that those, just those evil people raped his daughters. God's trying to demonstrate the depravity of our hearts. And when you get to Leviticus 20, we like to read these ones, right? If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. They tried to trip Jesus up with this one. He said, oh yeah, where's the adulterer? (laughs) Go home, don't sin no more. If there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Oops. If there is a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed incest. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lies with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They surely shall be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. God's just given a commentary. They're all heinous in his eyes. If there is a man who marries a woman and her mother, it is immorality. Both he and they shall be burned with fire so that there will be no immorality in your midst. If there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death and you shall also kill the animal. If there is a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is on, upon them. The difference between this and adultery is what? They both deserve death. 
Just adultery. We wink at this today, guys. I'm not, I'm not trying to yell at you. I'm just so passionate about it. Because it was that unintentional thinking that kept me in darkness and a slave to fear for so many years. It's all heinous in his eyes. You know, we, we get all upset because there's TV shows with gay couples on them now. Yet all the while, our favorite characters are people who are living out of wedlock and making love all over the place. Do you ever watch Oceans 11, 12, 13, 28? They're about criminals who are stealing and robbing. And we aggrandize these people. Oh, let's see how they're going to get out of this. That's wrong. And we want to point our finger at that guy over there. Let me tell you a story. I made a new friend, right? And he shared a story with me that I asked him permission to use. Now, now he's a, a pastor to pastors, okay? He's a pastor to pastors. And I won't use his name because I promised I wouldn't. And one of these pastors that he shepherds came to him because he had a dilemma. And there were some new people in his church. They pledged membership. And they, they liked to sit right in the front row, but they were both really obese. Now that they're members, Pastor, how should I go about addressing that with them? And so my friend was like, are you, like internally, he was like, are you serious? He was like, really? Sure, you can go ahead and address that. The minute you address every other sin you're overlooking, do not pick on the most obvious thing that you don't understand in front of you. It's the same thing. It's not new. This doesn't take God by surprise. We've had a sheltered life in America. And now that shelter is moving away and we're beginning to see things as they really are. But don't miss this, right? Why do you keep doing that? Such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in His Spirit. And you see, the cross of Jesus Christ is what washes us. It's what makes us clean. Because God told Adam and Eve right then and there, He said, look, I've got a way out for you guys. Sure, there's death. Sure, all this stuff is coming into the, into the world. But He said, my son is going to come and He's going to take all of your punishments. Right from Adam and Eve's all the way to the last human being that will ever put their faith and trust in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, on that cross. And I will make you clean. Because Jesus is God. He is fully man, fully God, 100% without sin. And so his sacrifice means something. All that sin was put on Jesus. And if you remember at the cross, they were beating him and doing all these things. And Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They do not know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And it's the same with people out there who are struggling with whatever they're struggling with. They don't know what they're doing. And so you see, for the first time in my life, I had hope. Hope that what I was struggling with could be taken away. Hope that what I prayed to God so many years ago would finally come to pass. So as you may or may not know, I had a, a degree in theater and I was going around and I was acting for a living. And you know, the, the key to being a successful actor is working. If you work, you're successful. Um, right? How many hours? Oh, I'm an actor and they do stuff. They're not acting. So I got a call back for rent. Yeah. Notice I was not in rent. <laughs> but I did get cast in a bus and truck tour. Now, a bus and truck tour, if you guys don't know, it's when they take, you know, actors who are working for their equity. Because, you know, in order to be actors, equity, and union, you got to have enough hours and money and, you know, pr prove that you really can do this, that you're worthy of the union. And so they, they put you in a bus for six months and a truck, and it's miserable. So I got a call back for this, and then I got cast, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do or not. Because, you know, I don't know, I really want to do that show. So now I'm getting kind of weird because I'm preaching to everybody. I'm getting high, and I start talking about God all the time and what I'm learning. And, and these people are like, dude, you're a buzzkill. I, I even had people tell me, you're not welcome in our home anymore. You can't come back. You can't come back. So the few friends that I had left, me and my friend Fresh, his name was, um, I won't tell you his first name, but that was, his name was Fresh. So he and I were hanging out one day in Plainfield, New Jersey, in, uh, in the projects. And so, you know, I'm white. <laughs> I don't really belong there. So he and I are hanging out in the front, his front steps one day, and we're 
smoking blunts and just high and freestyling and doing whatever it is. We would do cutting up. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning because this is when my life, I was an active creature at night. And the daylight hurt my eyes, you know. And, and it did. It did, Dennis. I'd like shut the blinds, you know. And so we're out there and we're doing, and this dude comes along. Now, I had never met this dude before, so of course I get a little nervous because white guy in all black neighborhood in the 90s. <laughs> so his name was Mike. Now, Mike was Jamaican, he was from the islands. And he comes to sit down to get high with us, and he has this manila folder with him. And he takes this manila folder and he puts it down, and this piece of paper slips out, and I look, and on it is a poem about Ja. And so I said, hey, Mike, man, I'm like, what's that about? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. I said, no, no, man, I want to hear. I want to hear. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. So this guy preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. God didn't leave me at the altar. He sent somebody who was willing. And so he gets to the end of his presentation, and he begins to give this illustration to me. And he says, just forgive me, but... He says, you know, man, he said, you're going to go to your car tonight. There's going to be a man, he's going to put a gun to your head. He said, and you're going to die. That bullet's going to pierce your brain. And he said, you know what? He's going to steal all your stuff, steal your car. He said, if in that one moment you doubt, you ain't going. You got to be that sure of who he is, man. No fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear. He kept telling me over and over again. And so I'm high, so I'm like, yeah, you know, and I go and, and I, and I, you know, and, and tell oh, God works. And so then I said, Mike, I got to share this story with you. So I told him about my dilemma with doing this bus and truck tour, how and it was going on. And, and he grabs my hand. He's like, oh, you got to go, brother. That's God's calling on your life. No fear, no fear, no fear. I said, Yeah. I got to my car and I looked over my shoulder because I was very afraid. And I got home to my apartment across from the Gothos Bridge. I looked at that orange flame every time. And I went and I called up with Andy from the theater company. And I said, hey, I'm going to do it. And she says, wait, wait, how would you like to make some extra money? And I said, oh, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> money, right? And she says, wait, wait, before you say yes, let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to drive the scenery truck. Yeah, I'll do it. And she says, no, 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 you don't understand. You're not going to be with the rest of the cast and crew. You and one other person are going to drive by yourself 15 to 20 hours a day. You will have to keep uh, Department of Transportation logbooks. You will hate this person. You have a governor on your truck. You will not be able to go over 55 miles an hour. And you will not be able to take half the roads that they take. So it's going to take you longer. Sign me up. She said, great. How about your drug test? <laughs> Failed miserably. How I successfully passed my drug test is another story when we talk about sin. And, <laughs> and so needless to say, I passed my drug test, woo right? And I go and we're there. And I, you know what? But I'm sober now. I'm so sober and I'm looking at life. And the first week, two weeks, three weeks weren't so bad. But all of a sudden, man, I just started like hating life and hating everybody. I couldn't stand the queen I was living with. I couldn't stand the person I was driving with. I couldn't stand the way this person did this on stage. I couldn't stand the fans that were coming up to me afterwards wanting my autograph. And I just, I just couldn't handle it anymore. I was just so grumpy and angry all the time. We'd go to these gay bars and we'd pull into town and there we were, like this meat market, deciding who you were going to pick to take home with that night. Oh, it was bad. So, we got to go to New Orleans. I got to go to the French Quarter. The theater company gave us three days off, didn't book any shows for us so that we could enjoy New Orleans. New Orleans. Home of the Takey Audi Kitchen. So, I paid all this money for my lover to come down, get on a bus, and come see me. We'd have a great time in New Orleans together. I mean, he was just grumpy and complaining about everything. Like, dude, just forget it. Like, you're here with me. Like, we have all this fun, you know? It's all right, fine. So we go out to the main street. I forget what it's called. And so we're out there, and we're drinking and drinking. I couldn't get high, but we were drinking and drinking and drinking. I was, like, staggering drunk. Me and Jen. Love Jen. And so we were drinking it and drinking it. And I was just like staggering. I couldn't even see straight. 
So I finally make my way into an alley. I walk down there and I start vomiting. And while I'm vomiting, this girl comes up behind me. I start feeling me up. In places nobody should feel. And I mean like vomits, like literally coming out my mouth. And she's trying to make it with me while I'm vomiting. And I turn around and I was like, what? She's like, get away, you know. I don't play that way. So I walked back out onto the street and man, did God open my eyes that day. You guys remember the story of Elisha, Elijah and the servant? And he was really worried because all the enemy's armies were coming and, 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 and Elisha's like, Mm-mm. and all of a sudden the servant's like, Ugh! he sees the whole spiritual world before him, man, that's what it was for me. I, I went out in that alley and, and all of a sudden, man, I saw it. There were like demons over here and there were like zombies and dead people over here. And God said to me, you are messing with death. I scared the daylights out of me. So I said, come on, let's go home. So we make our way back home. I'm starting to sober up a little bit. I expelled a lot of alcohol. So I'm starting to sober up, right? And so we, we wind up in bed. And, and, and I just remember just having sex with this guy. And I was so angry at him and so angry at everything. And I just began to just pour out all my anger and everything into what I was doing. And I was going to hurt him and I was just going to make him pay for everything. And I was so angry. And I said, this is the last time I'm ever going to do this with you. And I sent him home. And I made a commitment. Jesus, I am going to follow you. I'm going to call it my Uncle Joe. When I get home and he and I, and he's going to teach me about God. Because see, Uncle Joe is very vocal about God and very transparent about, you know, how he messed up and all this. Stuff. He's a good believer, you know. Love my Uncle Joe. And I pull into Santa Fe and there's this message waiting at the desk for me. And it says, hey, call home immediately. It's an emergency. So I call home. I call my mom. I say, what's the matter? And she says, here, talk to your father. He said, Tim, my brother Joe just died. Talk about fear, right? What am I going to do? Who's going to teach me about Jesus now, right? So there's a Mormon kid on the trip, and he and I hung out because he's got morals, and so we just talk bad about everybody else. But I'm not picking on Mormons. I'm just, it's part of the story. So he's, he's, really, I'm not. So he, he, you know, my point was that he had a, a moral compass, and I was hanging with somebody with a moral compass. Now, here's what God did. So I was going to go home, and the theater company was going to fly me home for those couple days for the funeral. And I called my Aunt Joanne, my Uncle Mary up. And I said, hey, what, I gotta come home. And my Uncle Mary said, Tim, why do you wanna come home? He's not here. He's with Jesus. He says, there's just sad people here. He's like, God's got you on something right now. Just, just finish what God has for you. Okay, so he convinced me. And so the tour gets cut short one month early. It is now December 24th, Christmas Eve, And I am standing in the streets of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, waiting for my mom to come pick me up because my lover didn't drive. And so she's coming to pick me up and it's Christmas Eve. So I was like, oh, great. I don't have to be with him because it's Christmas Eve. I'm going to go to my parents' house. I'm not going to go to my crib. So we go and I was like, yeah, I'm going to spend it with my family. I'll I'll see you you when Christmas is over. Okay, no problem. But then I found out my dad didn't pay any of my bills for me while I was gone. He just paid the rent. That was it. I had all these bills. <laughs> I had a lot of credit card debt. And, um, and so he didn't pay anything. So I called up the restaurant that I worked at. And I was like, hey, I, I need work. And they were like, oh, dude, we'd have you back in a heartbeat. So I came back and I worked double shifts. Open, close, open, close, open, close. And I just kept doing that because I, I needed the money. So New Year's comes and go and I keep holding him at bay. And finally, January 15th is his birthday. It's a Monday. And I said, hey, I, you know, let's hang out for your birthday. You know, yeah. And he's so excited. So I, I'm going to do it tonight. So I pull into the apartment complex and he comes down the path and he gets in the car. Just the love in his eyes. He was so happy to see me. So I looked at him and I said, hey, I got something to tell you. And he said, what? And I said, um, I can't see you anymore. He said, not even his friends? I said, no, you can't even be in my life. He got angry. He said, I knew it. I've been with other people. <laughs> yeah, right. So have I. So he gets all angry and says a lot of stuff and he slams the door and he's walking up the thing and I look in and I hear this voice that says, drive, 
Don't look back, drive. And so I did, and I'm holding my breath over the speed bumps, you know, and out the road, get back on to Route 27 Lincoln Highway. And I remember exhaling, and I just felt this weight come off my shoulder. A real physical weight just came off me. And the first words out of my mouth were, I'm free. I'm finally free. So I call up my aunt, Joanna, my uncle Mario, and I said, hey, can I come to church with you? And they were like, yeah, come on, we need it this time. Just come to our house, you know, no big deal. So what do I wear? Whatever you want. All right, so I come and we go to church. This is like no church I've ever been. You know, I grew up Catholic, you know, the spires and all that stuff. And I go and they met in a gymnasium. They didn't have their own building. They still don't. So if you want to donate to Christ Community Church <laughs> at uh, Piscataway, New Jersey, that'd be awesome. Property's too expensive. But anyway, they're... they're we go and they're meeting in this gym and like, there's like no message I, I ever heard before, you know, and, and the band is playing and Pastor Dennis, his name was Dennis too. And so Pastor Dennis sends me a handwritten letter. Hey, thanks for coming. I was so glad you came. If you ever need anything, I'm here. It's like, Ma, they wrote me a letter. Pastor in ink. So I go back and I got involved in a small group, all this other stuff. And, and so I'm sitting there one day in the service. There's this young teenage boy in front of me. And he's got a Bible cover on his Bible. And it's sitting next to him. And it looked like exactly like this. No fear. 2 Tim 1 7. So I got a Bible and I looked it up. And the NIV reads this way. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear but one of love, of power, and self-control. And as I read on, I read about Paul, therefore do not be ashamed of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. And Paul goes on, and I, and I it's like, I want to be that guy. I want to be in chains for what God has for me. I want to be that. I don't want any fear anymore. No fear. Just kept thinking about what Mike said. No fear. And so... I realize that God has given me a spirit of love. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of love. It's a spirit of power. I have abilities in Christ. And self-control, that means I'm in control, not sin. I have the power to choose what I do and what I don't do. And this became my life verse. This is my life verse. No fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 Do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. There is no fear in God. So, about a year passes and I quit doing drugs, quit hanging out with people. I'm working at 7-Eleven and my small group just loved on me. They kept me from eating hot dogs and grillers and, you know, and they'd come over to their houses and they just loved on me, you know, and just kept filling me up. And so, I go back on tour again because the touring company needs me for a part. They, I need, they needed that part again. And so, can you do it for a couple of weeks? I don't think it was maybe two weeks a month. It doesn't matter. So I go and I go to Philly and I, you know, rehearse with the cast real quick and we go back out on the road and I didn't have to drive this time. So guess what I started doing? Started getting high again. And it escalated, man, quickly. It was like Satan's like, we got a lot of ground to cover, you and I. And so I finished with the tour and I come home and I'm using again. And so all of a sudden this buddy fresh... And I Hank, start hanging out again, and we wound up at my house one day, and we were smoking, and we were naked. I don't know why, but we were. I was a freak. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was my nickname, Freak. Everybody called me Freak. And um, they meant it out of love. They really did, because I was just like so different from anybody they had ever met. <laughs> and I can remember, like, remember Cheers? Who remembers Cheers, right? Remember Norm? He'd walk in, good afternoon, everybody. And they'd be like, Norm, right? So I'd walk in, except I was a little salty and bitter. And I'd come in and I'd be like, this and freeway, blah, 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 blah. And everybody would be like, freak. You know, and I'd be, yeah, whatever. And that's who it was. Just hung out. People just celebrated me. People liked me. So we're sitting there naked, smoking pot. And Fresh says to me, hey, freak. Yeah? Can I sleep with you? Fresh. Fresh. So you know what I did? Showed him my bedroom. And so here we are in bed, getting ready to do what I do best. And this voice says to me, Tim, if you do this, you should go back to your lover. 
because you haven't changed a bit. I don't know if that was God or not. So I look at him and I said, I can't do this. And that was the last day I ever saw him. I sent him home. Still doing drugs, though. It's August 23rd. We're coming near the end. So it's August 23rd, and it's a Saturday night, and I'm higher than high than high. And I am just so wasted. And I'm laying on my futon couch staring at TV. as a show about drugs. <laughs> it's about cocaine and how it rots your brain from the inside out. And I was like, wow. And all of a sudden, I realized, like 3 in the morning, I realized I'm not breathing anymore. I'm just laying there, and my chest is getting tight. And I was, started saying to myself, Tim, breathe. Breathe. Tim, breathe. You have to breathe. Breathe. Oh, God, don't let me die tonight. Breathe. Breathe. And finally, this breath comes into my lungs. <sighs> so I got high again. I'm an idiot. So now the sun's coming up. It's August 24th. The sun's coming up, and I made this commitment. I'm going to go to church. So I'm getting dressed and going, and a little behind schedule. And I get in my car, and I lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and I had to go all the way to Edison. And which is like Wachuca City to like, I don't know, Bisbee, you know, it's far away. And plus, it, you know, so I'm on Route 1, I'm driving, there's this motorcycle behind me, gang guy, he's got colors and everything, like a real full-fledged biker. And so, not just a weekend warrior, but he comes out, you know, he's following me, and I figure, all right, we're on the highway, right? So we get off the highway, and he gets off the highway, and every turn I made, this guy followed me. Now I'm getting panicked, because I got the little Jesus fish on my car now, and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to beat me up. And so I get to the church and I pull in the parking lot. He pulls in behind me and I look and there's like 14, 15 motorcycles in the parking lot. I was like, it must still be high. This is a dream. And so I get out of my car, you know, and I look in the gym window and there's Pastor Rick. He's got his black leather jacket on, sunglasses. Joe Davis in the worship band is, oops, sorry, Joe. And they were playing, um, uh, they were playing Bad to the Bone. And I'm like, oh man, I am really wasted. So I walk in and I'm late in worship. It's starting, there's all these bikers in the church. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. So I sat like two rows from the back. And Pastor Rick says, I guess you've noticed our strange friends today. So brothers and sisters, I want you to welcome bikers for Christ. And I was like, no way, forget it, done. This is all nonsense. They were different words, but I cleaned it up. And I was like, this is, this is nonsense. I was like, this is not. Bikers are not Christians. There's no way. And so I resisted everything they said the whole time. But over in the back corner, off to my right, was this big, tall, black man looking like Aaron Neville. You know, big arms, denim jacket, earrings. I said they had a deeper voice. And I started undressing this dude with my eyes and thinking every nasty thought I could think about him because I was done with all this Jesus stuff. And so Doc, who was the, the MC, was like, Brother Big D is going to come up and give his testimony. Why don't you come on up, Big D? And I said, all right, this should be good. Let's hear this. I was a biker and now I love Jesus. And I just continued to listen to him. You know, I don't know what his testimony was. To this day, I cannot remember but here's what I knew by the end of his story, that he was in pain and Jesus made it go away. And here I am crying. I mean, like a battered child crying, you know, like with the <laughs> snots and boogers all in my face. And so Doug says, you know what? If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you come on up here. And he kept asking and I'm sitting there Nobody's getting up. We were like 40 people. Everybody's saved. And all of a sudden, I hear this voice, and it says, get up. So I look behind me. <laughs> Thought it was the guy behind me. You know, like, come on, get up, you know? And he's just sitting there. And I heard it again. Get up. Hey. So I heard it the third time. And I said, that's God. And I did. I got up. 
And I drop my Bible on the metal folding chair, you know, bang, you know, and here I am walking out and I get to the aisle or, you know, maybe as many rows as this. And I'm just like walking this walk. And there up in the front of the church was Big D. And the dude had his arms out wide. And I walked up to him and I just buried my face in his chest. And I just started crying and crying and sobbing. And these red shirted like boogers like all over his breast. And he was and I just cried and cried and cried. And he finally pulls me away and he looks me in the face. He comes down to where I was and he says, What is it, brother? What's going on? And I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed of who I was and all I had been. And he said, You know what, brother? It doesn't matter. He said, You're forgiven. And he pulled me back in and let me cry some more. And I have never looked back since. August 24th, 1996. And my church was so awesome. After a couple weeks, you know, I'll spare you all that stuff, but... After a couple weeks, I finally told my church what I was struggling through. And and Pastor Dennis, he said, hey... Well, Tim, he said, I... I don't know anything about that. He said, um, but he said, um, you're welcome here and um, I love you and we'll we'll walk through it together. Rick married Amanda and I. I mean, Dennis married Amanda and I. And um, Patty still prays for us to this day. We gave her a picture, right? She said, please pray for us when we get married because we're going to need it. And to this day, she keeps it right in her kitchen. She said, every day I still pray for you. Thank you, Patty. And so, but my church was so awesome. They just loved me. They would ask me questions to try to understand what I was thinking. They didn't pressure me with anything. They just loved me. They just loved me. And, you know, they let God do the rest, right? Amanda's always telling me, right? Just go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and let him do it. Just, that's it. He'll do the rest. And so what I want you to understand is that perfect love casts out fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to be afraid of. Fear can make you do all kinds of stuff. And I don't know what you're struggling with. And there are people here who are struggling with whatever, not just homosexuality. You're struggling with whatever. And you may think it's this minute little childhood thing that you should be immune to. But let me tell you, it's in the back of your mind. And everything you do and everything you do, it says it's because of this. That's fear. There is no fear in Jesus Christ. All fear is gone. All fear is gone. And so let me clear up some stuff for you real quick. Not all homosexuals are pedophiles. Pedophiles are pedophiles. I know plenty of gay and lesbian transgender people who fight for children because it's wrong and it's evil. Not everybody's like that. A second misconception is that the gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, transgender questioning community, they have a philosophy that if you're not, you will be when we're done with you. I know plenty of them who celebrate their children in straight relationships and are so happy. Another one is, is that every one of them is trying to undress you with your eyes and they want to make it with you, bro. Dude, even gay people have standards, man. Don't flatter yourself, you know. You know, it's the truth. I mean, just because I'm a snake, right, and I like women, doesn't mean every guy is like that, right? I mean, we know. You guys, you don't struggle with that. You're married. Does it mean that a beautiful woman comes by and you're not like, whoa, and you have to bounce your eyes away? You know, gay people do that too. They're, 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 They're respectful. See, fear will make us do all kinds of crazy, stupid things and make all kinds of crazy choices. But what I need you to understand that it is a God-given thing, a God-given thing to want to unite with somebody and be one with somebody for the rest of your life. God puts that in us. That's God-given. Don't get mad at that. Get mad at sin. Get mad at the enemy. It is a God-given right to want to be comfortable in your own skin. I should know. 
I was not comfortable in my own skin. And towards the end, this is who I was quickly becoming on a regular basis. This is who I wanted to be. I was not comfortable in my own skin. So uh, people wear tattoos, people do their hair, they get earrings and piercings, all these different things to try to feel more comfortable in their own skin. That's God-given. Sin, remember what happened to Adam and Eve? They tried to hide right away. They were not comfortable with themselves anymore. And it's a God-given thing to just want somebody to accept you and love you for who you are. For who you are. Don't we all want that? Don't we want to return to that innocence we had in the garden to say, this is who I am. And without somebody laughing at you or telling you an idiot, you're a fool. Fear will make people do the strangest things. And those of you who suffer with all kinds of things, man, let me tell you, there is no fear. There is no fear in Jesus Christ. We make choices based on fear every day of our lives. Trying to do the best that we can to just make the fear go away. The enemy's got us. But perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. No fear. In church, we have no fear. What can they do to us? Why are we afraid of them? We're on a mission of reconciliation. Let's reconcile people to God, whoever they are. And if you are struggling with something, I don't care who you are, I don't care what it is, if you have fear in your life and you want no fear, I encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. He will, perfect love casts out that fear. That's the truth. I stand here today because of it. I don't know who you are, but I know there's people out here struggling with whatever. And you have fear who you are, what you, think, what you think people will think. And I got news for you. If you stand up right now and you said, I want that, and you came to this front right now, nobody in here would blink an eye. And when somebody does, no fear. Because you haven't experienced it all, but God has. So I invite you. If you have any fear and you need it gone, you just stand up and come up here and I'll, I'll pray with you. And I promise you, I will not leave you at the altar. I will not leave you. I'm here. Because Jesus never left me. I'm never going to leave you. No fear.